Hello, everyone. Y buenas tardes. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are excited to see such a diverse group of folks joining us to learn about these really interesting topics during this truly historic time for CPS families. So uh, just one last thing before we go on ahead and get started. Uh, we're going to go through uh, some of the goals that we have for today's session. Um, because we imagine that's what brought you here today, and we want to make sure that you get what you want from this session as well. So our goals for today is that we want everyone to walk away with a better understanding of the following. First is the shift to the elected school board. Second is the legal and ethics requirements for being a board member. The third is the role of the board member. And lastly, what it's actually like to be a board member. So our first topic for today's session is just an overview of the upcoming shift to an elected school board. And as many of you may know, there have been calls for Chicago to shift to an elected school board for years. And the first legislation establishing this transition was passed in 2021. And we won't go into this one in great detail as that public act is linked in this deck for your reference later on. Then earlier this year, Public Act 103-058-415 provided us with some additional clarification on how that transition would actually occur. And we're gonna get into some of those details on the next few slides. So we're here with you today on an exciting milestone in this shift to an elected school board, as today was the first day that candidates could actually file their nominating petitions with the Chicago Board of Elections. And that filing period will end at 5 p.m. next Monday, June 24th. After that filing deadline, the next major date that we want everyone to have in mind is the general election taking place Tuesday, November 5th. This is when registered voters will get to vote for their elected school board members. The mayor will then make appointments by December 16th, and the new hybrid board will take office on January 15th, 2025. In order to get ready for their new roles, all board members will participate in onboarding and professional learning before this date. So the city of Chicago has been divided into 10 sub-districts, which are numbered one through 10. Each of those districts was then divided into two sub-districts, an A and a B. And we've linked this map in the deck for you um, in part of our resources, so you'll have access to that when we send that out to you. For the 2024 elections, candidates interested in running for an elected school board seat will run from whichever of the 10 districts in which they reside. And in order to get on the ballot November 5th, Candidates must submit a nominating petition that has been signed by at least 1,000, but not more than 3,000, of the registered voters residing within that district. Every candidate must also be a U.S. citizen, at least 18 years old, and a registered voter of that specific district. They must also have a minimum of one year residency in Chicago and in their electoral district, and must not be a child sex offender. Later on, we're gonna hear more about the legal and ethics requirements for individuals to serve as a board member as well. So as part of the transition to the elected school board, there'll be a hybrid board for 2025 and 2026, where each district is represented by one elected and one appointed board member. Once the 10 elected board members have been voted into office, the mayor will then appoint a board member in each of the 10 districts and the appointees must reside in the sub-district in which the elected board member does not reside. So for example, if we're looking at the map on the slide, if the board member elected in District 5 resides in sub-district 5B, the mayor would then appoint a board member that resides in sub-district 5A. The mayor will also appoint a board president who will serve the city at large. And just some additional information, um, all board members, whether they're elected or appointed, and the board president will serve without compensation. And the terms for all the board members and board presidents who start their term in January 2025 will be for two years. And we'll talk a little bit more on the next slide about how this is going to change moving forward. If there are any vacancies that occur for appointed members, the board, the mayor will appoint a successor to fill the vacancy for the remainder of the unexpired term. 
For elected board members, the vacancy will be filled by majority vote of the remaining board members for the remainder of the expired term. And this must be done within 30 days. So as you just heard on the last slide, all of the board members who start their term on January 15th, 2025, both the elected and the appointed will serve for two years. Then starting on January 15th, 2027, all board members and the president will be fully elected. Their terms will either be for two or four years as specified in Public Act 103-058-415. And we have provided a visual on the next slide, which may help to clarify this a bit. On this slide then, you can see how the length of the terms will vary across different sub-districts and during different elections. And this is indicated on the slide by the lighter and darker shadings. And we understand that this is a complex and new process, but as a reminder, you'll get this deck after today's session so that you can revisit some of these slides in more depth. Okay, so that was a lot of information. And before we move on, I'll just remind you to go ahead and enter your questions on the Q&A feature. And depending on how much time we have, we'll answer a few of these questions at the end of this session, and then others we'll respond to on our website. So uh, before we move on to the next topic, which is around legal and ethics requirements for being a board member, um, I will introduce our general counsel, Ruchi Verma, who will take us through the first section, and then our ethics advisor, Jennifer Chan, who will cover the next few slides. Ah, thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ruchi Verma, and I am the general counsel for the Board of Education. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, there are both statutory requirements and requirements mandated by the district that we will cover on this slide. Um, I'm not gonna read everything on this slide. There is a lot of information on this slide. And as Gabby has mentioned, uh, we will send out this doc after the presentation. Um, I wanted to highlight a couple of the requirements and the training mandates. Um, so as we've already discussed, by law, board members must be 18 or older, a US citizen, a registered voter, um, and a resident of Chicago in their electoral district. Um, board members cannot be a child sex offender. Uh, board members cannot also hold another public office unless permitted by law. Um, board members must comply with a statute, and here it's uh, listed, 105 ILCS 5 slash 10 dash 9, um, and that statute prohibits board members from having an interest in any contract, work or business of the district. This is a requirement for all school board members in Illinois. Um, a board member cannot be an employee of the district. Um, an employee of the district can be a candidate for a board member, can run as an elective candidate, but if successfully elected, cannot continue to be a CPS employee. Uh, board members must undergo certain training uh, the Board of Education must follow the Open Meetings Act and therefore be trained on this law. Further, board members must receive training on the Illinois Mandated Reporter Training and CPS Code of Ethics. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Jennifer Chan, our ethics advisor. Thank you, Ruchi. So... Hi, I'm going to provide an overview of the Code of Ethics as it pertains to board members. Board members owe a fiduciary duty to act in the best interest of the board and the public by avoiding conflicts of interest and acting in good faith. So this is like the core principle of the Code of Ethics. So in each of these slides, in each of the boxes on the slide, the ethical requirements from the Code of Ethics stems from that fiduciary duty to act in the best interest of the board. For example, in the first box, board property and funds are to be used for board purposes only. If they are used for non-board purposes, the board member is not meeting their fiduciary duty and may be viewed as putting their personal interests above their board responsibilities. Similarly, in the second box, a board member who is privy to confidential information in the course of doing their board work must keep this information confidential. All board members must comply with disclosure requirements to illustrate in part to the public that they are mindful of their fiduciary duties. 
Then there are post membership restrictions that are imposed upon board members to ensure to the public that board members did not serve the district to enhance themselves or their families when their term ends. Moving to the second row of the slide in the bottom left hand corner, political activity is prohibited when conducting board business, engaging in board activities or using board property or board resources. Political activity is only permitted when acting in a personal capacity and with personal resources. Um, and just to give you a brief example, uh, political activity pertains to elections and candidates, not necessarily to any kind of political causes. Um, and then all board members, uh, their spouses and members of their households are subject to the gift ban, so it is clear that they're not enriching themselves when serving as board members. Similarly, board members cannot use their position to gain any kind of economic interest or any other interest that is distinguishable from the general public. Finally, board members cannot hold two positions that require fiduciary duties that may be in conflict with each other. This is the rationale for why a board member cannot also be an LSC member or a CAC member. If board members are careful to meet their fiduciary duties, taking care to ensure that they do not commingle their personal lives with their board responsibilities, then they are abiding by the core principles of the code of ethics. And now I'd like to transition over to back to Gabby. Thank you so much, Ruchi and Jennifer, for that great information. Um, and as a reminder, for those of us that are joining live, uh, please be sure to share your questions using the Q&A feature. Um, we will now go ahead and move to the next section of today's presentation, which is the role of the board. And we are really so fortunate to be joined uh, by Board of Education Vice President Elizabeth Todd Breland and board member Michelle Morales, who will talk us through the next few slides and then answer some questions about what being a board member is actually like. Uh, so Vice President Todd Breland, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, so if we, first I'm happy to be here and to talk about this really important topic at this exciting time for our community. Um, so the board has a responsibility to the CPS community. And it really is a tremendous responsibility. And by community, um, we mean our over 320,000 students from diverse backgrounds with unique talents and needs along with their parents, caregivers, other family members. The CPS community also consists of our over 43,000 staff across uh, 634 schools and central office. The CPS community also includes our many, many partner organizations, our sister, sister organizations in the city, and really all of Chicago's residents. And as a board, we don't take this responsibility lightly. It's a big one. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? Um, so the responsibilities of the board, as has been mentioned a little bit already, are largely dictated by the Illinois School Code, specifically for Chicago by Article 34 of the Illinois School Code. And this core work of the board um, includes a number of things. It includes the hiring and evaluating of our CEO superintendent, as well as some other related personnel items. It involves uh, the fiduciary or financial oversight of the district, including approving the district's budget, the district's capital plan, and certain contracts and purchasing decisions. And finally, it includes governance. And governance includes things like approving the school year calendar, charter and contract school agreements, and district policies and intergovernmental agreements. But if we move to the next slide, I'd like to talk a bit more about governance, because um, I think sometimes that can be a tricky one to get your head around. So it feels important, I think, to say more about governance here in particular. And as part of governance, the board is responsible for establishing the direction, the goals, and the priorities for the district. But maybe just as important as what the board is responsible for is what, it's, what it does not do. So by statute, the Board of Education is not a legislative body. 
The CEO superintendent makes recommendations to the board that the board then votes on. Um, and this is again, part of the board's role as governance. The board and CPS ma CPS's management team make up the district's governance team, but it's CPS management's role to conduct the actual day-to-day -day operations of the district. And often when um, people are talking about school boards, they use uh, a, one of two metaphors I found to sort of discuss this distinction. Um, so one is the distinction between the balcony and the dance floor. So the idea is that the board or board members are on the balcony, while the people doing the actual work of the district are teachers, our school leaders, um, school-based staff, the CPS management team are on the dance floor doing that work. And so at the board level, by being a little bit of a level above, you can sort of ask questions and, and see, are these dance steps over here working with these dance steps over there and asking these higher level questions and dealing with some of these higher level um, issues. But it's not, for example, uh, board members work to, do, to teach in a classroom um, necessarily or to be managing um, personnel outside of the CEO superintendent. The other major metaphor that um, professional development organizations and others use to talk about board work is the idea of the board being the rudder, the rudder of a big ship. So while board members aren't necessarily, you know, wiping the decks and doing the, the work that's happening on the boat itself, it is at this higher level of direction, goals, and priorities for the district where that governance capacity, that ruddering is important in terms of what the role of the board is. So the board and the management team together from their respective roles work to create high quality experiences for all students. And this diverse range of responsibilities requires board members to invest a great deal of time and energy in really becoming knowledgeable about the wide range of topics that come before the board in order to make informed decisions. So now I'm going to turn it over to board member Morales who will talk a little bit more about the work of the board and what it's like to be a board member. So if you haven't figured it out already, being a board member is a lot of work. Uh, some people probably have seen us participating in our monthly board meetings and other public meetings, but what they may not see is all of the work that goes into being prepared for the business that takes place at those meetings. Every month, we spend hours reading, analyzing, and servicing questions on materials and other reports, which includes participating in se several debrief meetings monthly, apart from the two public meetings that often you as the public see. We also spend time participating in professional learning, uh, such as topical briefings, workshops, or conferences to further develop our capacity to govern effectively. Um, being a board member sometimes feels complicated, and so it's really up to all of us to have our own due diligence to make sure that we're attending professional development so that we are always learning on how we can become better board members. And, well, and while that takes uh, an, a large chunk of time, probably the most important, and honestly, I would argue, I think it's safe to speak for all of us, the most enjoyable part of being a board member is all of the community engagement. We try as much as possible to attend community events, to visit schools, to participate in CPS events and other special events, and we host office hours virtually so that members of the public can share concerns with us uh, that help us to deepen our understanding of what might be happening within the district. Uh, so next slide. And as you saw in that previous slide, it, it can average about 25 to 30 hours a week of work uh, that we're putting into just preparing for our meetings and making sure that when we're coming to our meetings, we're as prepared as possible. Sorry, sorry to confuse the slide person. <laughs> so. One of the most important things for everyone to know about the board is that an individual board member, uh, and I think this is very important for the public to know because I think this often get, uh, people get this confused. No individual board member has power or authority other than the right to cast a vote at a board meeting. Nor does any individual board member have the authority to speak on behalf of the board or on behalf of CPS. This is very important for folks uh, and especially for any folks that are watching this that are considering running for the elected school board, because as individual board members, we have our own opinions, our own, ex you know, whatever viewpoints, but that may not be reflective of the entire board and that may not be reflective of the district. 
And so we have to take care as individual board members that we are actually speaking as a collective and not as seven different individuals. Uh, in addition to this, CPS uh, board members often receive requests or concerns from members of the community. We all get them, we get emails, we, we get, obviously it happens during our um, uh, board uh, office hours. Sometimes when we're just out in the public as individuals, people will approach us with their concerns. And while it's so helpful for us to understand what communi community members are facing, what their lived experiences have been with CPS, as board members, we actually do not have the authority to take action on any individual concerns. And so board members actually work to deliver those messages that they hear directly from the community to CPS management, so that then CPS management is working to address the concerns of the community. And that's actually a really big component of our role and why representation is so important because through our board membership, we represent our communities, we represent our lived experiences, and often people feel more comfortable approaching us with those concerns that then we can elevate. And so, oh, so I think the next slide is the Q&A slide. Great, so thank you both for sharing that information. I think um, there's a lot of things that the public maybe has misunderstandings about or just hasn't taken a lot of uh, time to research and better understand. So it's really great that the two of you are able to share all of that additional information um, with folks. Um, so as we move forward, um, I think we're going to get a chance to hear a little bit more from the both of you in terms of your personal experiences as board members. Um, we do know that there's folks out there who have already filed their petitions this morning and others that are going to be filing over the next week um, and uh, want to kind of hear what it's like to be a board member. Um, so VP Todd Breland, uh, maybe I'll start with you and then uh, board member Morales, you can chime in after. Um, if you can just share with us, what is the best part about being a board member? Yes, the best part about, I mean, I think by far school visits and just being with students. Um, I love doing school visits. You get to speak with school leaders. You get to see students in their own element and speak with them. You get to see teachers in the classroom and really, you know, the art and craft and magic that happens in CPS classroom. So th that's always exciting. I think as board members, it's also important to get a sense of how the policies and different um, things that we're engaging with on the board level are playing out on the ground. Um, so that's really great. And I think just most gen more generally, just anytime we get to interact with students is the best, whether it's student voice events, roundtables, graduations, school visits. Um, CPS students are really amazing, and it's been a gift to be able to learn from them. Yeah, I would echo all of that and just add, I think another best part of being a board member is representing your community and your lived experience. Uh, so many of us on the board are former, I'm a former CPS parent. Both of my sons graduated from CPS. I'm a former alternative high school uh, teacher. Uh, and so I think, you know, using that lived experience and my lens when I'm reading the documents, when I'm going through all of the policies and everything that we're reviewing um, is also a great part of being a board member. You get to bring in not only your professional experience, but also your community experience and your experience of living in Chicago uh, into the lens of being a board member. And we think that that's incredibly important. Great, thank you both. And now on the flip side of that, um, board member Morales, if you can think about uh, maybe one or a couple of the things that have been the most challenging um, in terms of your service as a board member. Yeah, I, I actually think what I named as the best part is also challenging, right? When you represent your community on a board, the community holds you accountable and they want to see change happen quickly. Uh, and they think that because you are now serving on the board, that means that change is going to happen really fast. And that's not always the case for everything. And so while that's the amazing part, there's also pressure related to that and can make it really challenging. As we talked about earlier, our job as a board is actually not to manage the day to day. Um, and that can become frustrating when you're hearing about so many of the issues that many of your community members are maybe dealing with that at the end of the day, you actually can't do anything about it with your own hands. 
you have to pass it off and make sure that, you know, the person that you're passing it off to has the information. You have to have the trust also that change will happen. And so that can be really challenging, particularly when you have community members really wanting you to handle a particular situation. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I mean, I think I think of a number of different things. Let's see. I, I think I start by saying, I mean, on a personal level, I think it's actually very difficult to find time to do all of the things that feel necessary to do well to be a board member while also having a full-time job and being a parent and having family responsibilities. Earlier it was mentioned that the 25 to 30 30 30 uh, hours a month. I mean, I would say that's probably on the low end. Um, you know, it varies. And certainly I've been on the board for a little bit longer. So maybe, you know, taking on some additional responsibilities. Um, but it is it is a lot of time and a lot of work. And I think there was so much you were saying about misunderstandings. I, I didn't know so much about this role until I got into the position. Um, it is a vast and complicated system. I, as part of my job, I study CPS and I still learn things all the time um, being here. Um, but it also is by far the most important thing that I do in my professional life. And it's because the stakes are high. Um, it is an immense privilege and an honor to be a board member. And it's also a tremendous responsibility to make decisions that impact our over 320,000 students and more than 40,000 employees in our respective communities. And I think over and over again, at the broadest level, the most difficult thing um, and challenging thing is to see the great needs that our students have and not having always the resources to meet those needs. Um, being a chronically underfunded school system is certainly a challenging part about this work. And that is a condition that, you know, is not experienced by wealthy communities, right? Or, or wealthy school districts, but that is our reality here in CPS. And part of why we continue to advocate for um, funding for our schools, because I think too often we're forced to operate in a world of trade-offs that involve really difficult decisions. Um, we never have enough and we know that our children deserve the best. So I think that that can be very challenging. Yeah, thank you both for that. And so as we talked about, right, everyone's really excited about this shift to the elected school board, um, but we do know that there are lots of different changes coming with it in addition to the size, it's the elections, it's the districts and sub-districts. Um, I'm curious to hear from both of you, uh, kind of what are your hopes and thoughts and wishes for this 21 member school board? What um, thoughts do you have for them or for that uh, new body that's going to be emerging over the next several years? Um, and I think VP Todd Breland, if you don't mind getting us started. Sure. No, thank you. I mean, I'm excited for Chicago to have the same rights to democracy and an elected school board as every other school system in the state of Illinois. Um, and I think, you know, part, while part of this will come with sort of increased direct representation, I'm also hopeful for the ongoing um, focus on systems thinking, right? So board work is systems work. What you do or as importantly don't do in one part of the city or one part of the system impacts those other parts of the system. Um, and in my time here and getting ingrained and coming, kind of coming up as being a board member at the same time as the introduction of the CPS equity framework, one of the things that that framework does is it centers our school system's ongoing focus on students and families and communities that have experienced historical and ongoing disinvestment, um, structural racism, inequality. And so there's certainly lots of opportunity to continue to advance equity in our district. And so I'm really um, hopeful as we transition to the hybrid and then elect fully elected school board um, to continue to pursue, to have that ability to continue to advance um, equity work at a systems level. Yeah, same here. I mean, I think it's an exciting time to have representation on the school board. Um, and so to be able to have so many Chicagoans from different areas of Chicago representing their districts in their area to be able to serve on the school board, to lend their voice and their lived experience is what I'm most excited by and what I have most hope for. Great, thank you both. Um, and now I'm going to go through, I see our colleagues have been answering some of the Q&A in the chat. Um, I'm also going to take a few minutes to uh, go through some of the ones that I think we can give a little bit more color to as well. 
Um, so the first one is about how will decisions be made with such a big school board? Um, and as we talked about in the presentation already, um, each board member has the individual authority to cast one vote at a board meeting. And so some of the decisions coming before the board uh, require two thirds of the board members for board approval. Others just require a simple majority. Um, and so the larger school board, the 21 board members is gonna operate in a very similar fashion. So decisions are gonna be made um, by each member getting to cast their individual votes. And while board members don't have to support the decisions that are made by the board, um, effective board governance really dictates that board members support the process. Um, VP Todd Breland and board member Morales, I don't know if you have anything else, any other thoughts that you would like to share around um, what decision making might look like with this larger number of school board members. I mean, I guess I would just reiterate the point that you made that, you know, votes are still going to be votes, right? And items are going to be brought forward to the board and decisions um, will be made in that way. I think one of the things, certainly there will be more people. And one of the things that even we started about a year ago at this point was a bit of a change in the way that we've been doing um, public briefing. So prior, when I first came on to the Board of Education, um, what is now the Agenda Review Committee meeting, we have one tomorrow. Um, was were formerly um, private briefing, I should say non-public briefings with board members where members of the management team, according to Open Meetings Act, could only meet with two board members at a time um, to sort of update them and talk to them through agenda items in advance of the board meeting. So last year, we moved to make that um, a public meeting, the event agenda review committee meeting, in, in partially in preparation for the transition to a larger and hybrid and then elected school board, but also to kind of get into the work of what um, dividing up those pieces of the agenda into what may become um, separate committees or other types of structures um, may end up looking like. So I think there's been some preparation work that's already happened, um, you know, continuing uh, to think about how to get ready for that transition. Yeah, I don't have much to add. I think what's important for the public to know is all that goes into decision making uh, versus sort of the the um, quorum, which is what Gabriela was speaking to earlier, and sort of what's what votes are needed. Um, you know, not in addition to reading documents, et cetera, we have a fantastic uh board staff that helps answer any questions that we have i just want to say for the public you don't have to be an expert on cps to be a part of the board um i certainly am not and so so many members of the board of the board staff are here to really help us make our way through the documents and to understand the history and to understand sort of what's changed or or, or what's moving forward um and and also we get to have what's called deb uh, debrief meetings uh, where there's two of us in, in attendance with any member of CPS to go deeper into an issue that is uh, that needs to be voted on at a board meeting. And that really gives us space to really dive in and to ask questions. And so those are important elements in the preparation of the decisions. It just doesn't happen from reading and then voting. We actually spend quite a bit of time in debrief meetings, checking in with board, um, the, the staff that, the CPS staff that helps to staff the board uh, to help give us a deeper understanding of, of what the issues are and, you know, to help us with our vote. And similarly, again, just sort of to add to some of that, uh, the other sort of inputs are there. You know, when we have board office hours with community members where we're able to have um, deeper conversations than are often available or we're able to have in something like public comment where we're really just hearing um, from board, me from members of the community, um, as well as other opportunities for community engagement that are really valuable um, inputs as well as we're thinking about other decisions that we have to make as board members. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you both for adding on. Um, another question that we got, um, we actually had a couple of questions around a very similar topic um, from some of the audience members and folks who registered. Um, and it's this idea of, um, as we're shifting into this place where now individuals are elected and they will have campaigns and they may have funders, there may be people who are have different interests. Um, it's this real question about how do we continue to hold board members accountable 
for the community. So how do we make sure that they are being responsive to the community, um, which is right as the both of you have already talked about, that is their job as is to be responsive and representative of the community. Um, so I think a part of this question, you know, gets to um, also how, how do you feel like the community has held you accountable as board members in the time that you've been here. So if either of you want to talk about that, that would be great to hear. Well, look, I mean, I think the biggest thing that changes is that, um, you know, elected members are held accountable by voters, right? Um, and direct, more directly, I would say, um, by voters, the individuals who have the power to vote a candidate into or out, you know, out of, out of the board. But I think for everyone appointed or elected, once on the board, um, you know, members of the community meet with board members. They are people are very straightforward. <laughs> I found um, about you know making their voices heard, um, yeah. whether that's in public meetings, whether that's at the grocery store, whether that's you know run around your kids. Like pe Chicago does not play. Like they will let you know. Um, and I think, you know, just as a reminder, again, that all the seats on the board, including the presidency, will be up for re-election in 2026. So there's going to be multiple opportunities coming up. Yeah, I mean, I it, it is just like we, we hold any other elected official responsible, right? Um, to Elizabeth's point, we've been held uh, accountable in public comment. If you ever see me during public comment, I'm typing and I'm usually typing down what the issues are that people are raising so that I have a sense of the themes and who they are and what they're representing. Um, and public comment is a way for us to really understand sort of what's going on at the school, individual school levels. But people stop us, people talk to us, people, you know, um, share their thoughts or ask for clarity around, you know, things that we voted on. Um, and so you will find that you can hold your um, elected school board member accountable even in the general public. But more importantly, I think just like any other elected official, it will come with voting power. And so as Elizabeth stated, you know, in two years, you know, from 2025, you know, when their term is up in two years, if the person is not effectively representing your community in the way you wish they would, then that is up to the community of whether or not they will vote them out. So that's, I think, what makes uh, uh, an elected school board so exciting is that really it's going to be down to the power of the vote that can hold uh, the future elected school boards accountable, so school board members accountable. Yeah, definitely. One of the benefits of shifting to the uh, elected system, for sure. Um, so one more question that I that came in that I know is near and dear to both of your hearts, and I'll start with the um statutory response, but then you can both chime in a little bit more generally about the experience. Um, one of our audience members wanted to ask if students will be allowed to join the board. Um, and according to the Illinois School Code, the uh, Board of Education in Chicago is um, allowed to have a, a student board member, but they can only serve, um, serve in an advisory capacity, so they don't have any voting privileges. Um, but we know that the two of you both know and love our honorary student board members um, and just kind of wanted to hear from the both of you what you feel like the students add to our board meetings and add to the board. Well, we treat our honorary stu um, student board member as a board member. In our eyes, even though they don't have voting power, they're a board member. And so if, uh, if people uh, notice in the past, the honorary student board member was down on the floor. We asked that they get moved to be up on the dais with us to be representative that they are part of the board. And I think, uh, not I think, they are literally the constituent that is at the end of all CPS services, right? If we think about who's most impacted, it is the CPS student. And so having a student on the board is so important for us because often as we're really th going through policies, as we're going through, um, you know, potential vote that's coming up, they're the ones that we turn to to ask questions of what do you think about this? How do you think this, you know, this policy will actually impact young people? What has been your experience with this to give us, again, that deeper understanding of how the votes that we do as board members might impact uh, the young people that are being served by by CPS. 
Yeah, I would just add to it that I totally agree. Our honorary student board member may not have voting rights, but they are a board member and both in the public setting and certainly outside of that setting as well influence um, you know, what happens at the board level. One of the things that um, our honorary board member, and it, it can vary based on what that student board member's um, interests are, but they're very much involved in the um, student voice work of the district. They work with other students. They've created their own uh, you know, student work and ways of organizing students to get additional voices, of course, not just their own, um, but reaching out to other students and making sure that whether through roundtables, surveys, all types of different things in my time here that I've seen board members do, um, our student board member do, I should say, um, to make sure that that student voice is part of what we're hearing through them. And of course, also the many other avenues that we have. Great, thanks. And I will add as well that um, as long if we have any students who meet all of the eligibility requirements, um, they can also serve in one of our um, elected or appointed roles as well. So that is also open to them if they see that they are able to uh, meet all of those requirements. Um, and there are any individuals who want to, we know there are lots of amazing young people in our district, and we would definitely love to hear from them. Um, one more question that came up that I will turn over to the two of you for sure. Um, is uh, it sounds like this may be someone interested in running or maybe someone that's just curious about how you have spent your past year plus of being a board member. Um, so uh, what can a board member do to impact the families who approach them with problems? Um, so when you work as a body, right, you've already told us that um, the board can only serve as a board. Uh, so how is how do you balance this or how do you find the balance between being able to be responsive and supportive to families, um, but still recognizing this need to uh, serve as a board um, and not as an individual board member? I really appreciate that question because, you know, people do come to us often sometimes in moments of distress, right? And you want to be able to be um, responsive. And so I think when that does happen, being able to working with our Board of Education office staff to be able to connect um, families, um, concern uh, educators, whoever it is that's contacting us, uh, to get them in touch with the relevant CPS personnel who are responsible for addressing the issues that they're facing, I think is something that we try to do as quickly as possible. I mean, I'll be honest, I do struggle to keep up with my email. The inbox is is overflowing. Um, and so I'm not gonna lie, like things do, you know, fall through the cracks sometimes in, in that respect, um, but trying as much as possible to be attentive to that and making sure to get the concerns that are brought to us um, to relevant staff to be, who are responsible and able to address them. Yeah, and often we look for themes as well, right? Are we hearing uh, multiple concerns from multiple parents about a particular school or about a particular stat, you know. So whenever I'm um, going through my emails or um, having board office hours, I pay attention to themes and I pay attention to like, okay, whoa, this has come up multiple times. It came up in public comment. It's coming up in board office hours. I've gotten a couple of emails from different people. And then to, you know, what Elizabeth said, then reaching out to uh, the board staff, which is always helpful in helping us figure out who's the appropriate person to connect with, and then trying to, and then following up, right? Making sure, like, was this addressed? How is this, you know, a concerned address? What do we need to know for the future? So that, again, um, we're trying as much as possible to make sure that the right people in the district are also receiving these concerns and that are moving the issues forward. Great, thank you both. Um, and then there's one, a technical one that came in that I'll go ahead and take. Um, uh, people have been kind of interested now. It sounds like people are excited even more by what you have been sharing with them. Uh, folks are interested to know, how will I find out who is running in my district? Um, as we mentioned, today was the first day for folks to be able to uh, submit their nominating petitions. Um, but then moving forward, um, we have a week during that time, and then the Board of Elections will do their work to figure out who is going to go on the can the ballot in November, and it sounds like that should be done around the end of August. 
Um, so do check back. We'll have um, the map on our website where you can check what district you live in, uh, but then you could also go to the Board of Elections page uh, to be able to uh, see who are the individuals that are going to be on your ballot and start doing your research about who you're thinking about voting for. Um, another technical question that came in from our audience was around the term limits. Um, so we had that slide that was essentially showing that board members will serve for either two years or four years, and that changes based on the election cycle and based on the sub-district. Um, but there are no limits on the number of times that an individual can run or serve on the board. Um, so there will be um, the ability for individuals to rerun, and if they're doing a good job and people vote them back in, then they can continue to serve. Um, so it looks like that was a number of the questions that came in. It looks like there's still a few outstanding, but we will be sure to put those on our Q&A page. Um, but uh, board members, before I let you go, we do want to definitely hear from the two of you if you have any closing words um, whether it is for the families and voters across uh, the city, all of our CPS community, or individuals who are running, um, any kind of parting words or advice for folks as they're looking ahead to the for our first ever elections. No, just that thank you so much for joining tonight. We heard earlier today that there was over 100 people who registered uh, for tonight's uh, webinar. Uh, we're so excited that so many of you from the public took the time out of your evening, usually this is what around dinner time or people are cooking for dinner, to really learn about what it means to be on a board, right, and some of the legal and fiduciary responsibilities. So very excited that all of you joined us for tonight to learn more about what it means to be a board member for those of you who are considering running and for those of you who are considering who want to continue holding the CPS board accountable to learn more about what that looks like for the future. So thank you so much. Yeah, I also just want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I do want to acknowledge that I think there are a lot of questions that are still in queue, but I think part of what we're trying to do is make sure that we get thorough answers to those. And so I think Gabriella will probably say this again, but we will be making sure to post um, that answers to questions that were asked and we weren't able to answer live um, on the Board of Education website. Um, but again, just want to say like, this is an exciting time for the city of Chicago and there, there's so much, look, our schools are amazing. I don't care what anybody else says, I will be a CPS cheerleader for life. And there's just so much here, um, so much growth, of course, so many things that are going well and so many things that we, of course, need to continue to, to improve. Um, and so it's exciting to see this kind of energy in the city around Chicago public schools and around the opportunities we have um, to really do right by our kids. So um, I just think it's an exciting moment and I'm happy to see everyone, um, you know, logging on and getting that excitement as well. And that again, the board office is gonna work to make sure that we get answers and post those answers to questions on our website. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you both as well for sharing. And this was counted part of those 25, 30 plus hours of your month that you have <laughs> provided as your uh, board member roles. Um, before we do log off for today, I just want to remind folks, um, we did put together some resources for you and we will be emailing out the deck um, as well as the recording for everyone who registered. And the deck does have some helpful links in here, um, including uh, our website, the Board of Education website, um, where, as I mentioned, you'll be able to see uh, some of those requirements for running, for being a board member, and then post board member um, requirements. Uh, we'll also link the Chicago Board of Election websites. They are the ones that run the elections and have more details about all of the technical things. If you're thinking about running or trying to think about the um, election ahead, that'll be really the great place to get all of that updated information. Um, the Illinois Senate redistricting website is also linked here if you have questions about how the districts were made and all of the work that went into that, you're able to find out some of the community engagement that they did and see different versions of the maps and how they iterated over time and where they ended up. Um, another one on there is gonna be the uh, CPS map where you will be able to go ahead and turn on the overlay for the elected school board so that you can see where your address is, which uh, district and sub-district you belong to. So as you're thinking about that as well and looking ahead, 
Um, we heard from Jennifer Chan earlier, our ethics advisor. So we do have our CPS code of ethics included as well as a link on here for you to dig into a little bit more. There is a section specifically around board members. And so if you have any questions on that, feel free to reach out. And lastly, um, another document from the Illinois Association of School Boards um, that has some more information around ethics, requirements for being a board member, um, any conflicts of interest, things like that. Um, so we do want to go ahead and just say thank you for joining us. Um, as everyone mentioned tonight, we're so excited about this momentous shift that we're going through, and we really look forward to all of the great things that lie ahead for all of the students and families of Chicago Public Schools. Um, so do please be on the lookout for an email from us. Um, on our website, you can also find a page where you could submit any additional questions that you didn't have tonight or if you have any moving forward. Uh, but we really want to say thank you for joining us tonight. It was a pleasure.